Dr. Chapman, so great to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. We're so excited to be able to speak to you. So I wanted to ask you a few questions. Well, let's start with what are the five love languages for those that may not know? The five love languages are five different ways to express love on an emotional level. And they are words of affirmation. You look nice in that outfit. Words of affirmation. Uh, gifts, universal to give gifts as an expression of love. The gift says, they were thinking about me. Acts of service, doing something for the other person that you know they would like for you to do. Uh, quality time, giving them your undivided attention. I don't mean sitting on the couch watching television together. Someone else has your attention, but you're looking at each other or you're taking a walk together and spending time talking to each other. And then physical touch. And uh, out of those five, the basic concept is that each of us has a primary love language. That's the one that speaks most deeply to us. And if you don't speak their primary love language, you can be speaking some of the other languages and they still will not feel loved. So it's designed to help uh, couples or any, any individuals really that care about each other to express love in the most meaningful way to the other person. How did you come to this discovery? I discovered the five love languages out of my counseling. Uh, they would sit in my office and one of them would say, I just feel like he doesn't love me or she doesn't love me. And the other person would say, I don't understand that. I do this and this and this. Why would you not feel loved? And I knew people were sincere, but they were missing each other. In their mind, they were expressing love in a meaningful way, but it wasn't connecting with the other person. So I heard this over and over in my counseling office. So I don't know, several years into my counseling, I, I thought, you know, there's got to be a pattern to what I'm hearing. So I sat down and read several years of notes that I had made when I was counseling and asked myself, when someone sat in my office and said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me, what did they want? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories. And I later called them the five love languages. So I started using that in my counseling. Uh, you know, if you want her to feel love, you've got to speak love in her language. If you want him to feel love, you've got to speak love in his language. And I would help them discover each other's language and challenge them to go home and try it. And sometimes they'd come back in three weeks and say, Gary, this is changing everything. Whole climate's different now. And then I started using it in small groups. And the same thing would happen. And probably five years later, I thought, you know, if I could put this concept in a book, write it in the language of the common person, maybe I could help a lot of couples. I would never have time to see my office. Of course, little did I know the book would sell now over 13 million copies in English and be translated in over 50 languages around the world. So evidently, it's helping people <laughs> connect with each other, and that's, that was my prayer. Seeing what a success this book is and how it still is such a success, being that it was written in the 90s, have you ran across any other research since then that you would have gone back and added to the book, maybe even a sixth love language? <laughs> You know, I've had people suggest a sixth love language. For example, one man said, uh, Dr. Chapman, there's a sixth love language. I said, what is it? He said, chocolate. I said, well, if they bought it, it's a gift. If they made it, it's an act of service. <laughs> uh, and another guy said, uh, the sixth love language is going shopping with my wife. I said, well, that sounds to me like a dialect of quality time. She wants your attention with her as she's doing something she enjoys doing. So really, I, I have not come up with a sixth uh, love language that I think is valid, but I'm not dogmatic. Maybe there's a six, but so far I haven't discovered it. <laughs> Why do you think that young people have had, especially my generation, Generation Z, they've had such a struggle with relationships and monogamy? Why do you think this is? Well, I think many of them have grown up not feeling loved by their parents. I say to parents, the question is not, do you love your children? The question is, do they feel loved? See, he's sitting in my office as a 13-year-old saying to me, my parents don't love me. They love my brother. They don't love me. I knew his parents. I knew they loved him, but they hadn't connected. They hadn't spoken his language. And I think when a child grows up not feeding love by one or both parents, uh, 
life is much more difficult when you don't feel loved. And then I think, too, uh, the divorce rate in our country, uh, which often happens when the children are young, and the children feel like, you know, the parent that left doesn't love me, or they think the one that stayed, you ran them off, or, you know, all kind of thoughts and feelings go on inside that child growing up. And it just creates uh, emotional instability inside of them. And, and consequently, they don't, they don't feel loved, they don't know how to love, and yet they're hungry inside and, and they're often looking for love. And typically they look in the wrong places. And so they get involved in destructive relationships, so they get involved with drugs and alcohol or whatever, and, and it's just a downward spiral. Would you say that it is okay to ask your partner for the love language that you may not be receiving? Yeah, I think as a, I think as a couple, whether it's a dating couple or a married couple, I, I think we, we need to communicate uh, what makes us feel loved. Now, we, we don't want to demand that they love us, but we, we can request. You know, you can say, once you know each other's love language, if quality time is your language, for example, you can say, honey, you think we could get a weekend away? Or you think we could take a walk after dinner tonight? You can add, and now that they know that's your language, they're far more likely to say, yeah, honey, sure, we can do that. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think discussing this concept and understanding each other's language and then making requests of each other when you feel like, you know, you're, 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 I call it the love tank, the love tank is not full, you, you can request something. Uh, and, and love always is looking out for the other person's interest. Uh, love is the attitude which says, I want to enrich your life. I want to help you be the person that God wants you to be. And, and that, that's love. It's doing what God did for us, you know, when he sent Christ for us. So uh, that kind of love is not natural. By nature, we're self-centered. And I want you to love me, you know, and, uh, rather than my thinking in terms of how can I love you. But if we have an attitude of love, then the love language is, gives you information on how to adequately express love, effectively express love. Are love language, love languages, are they multicultural? You know, that's what surprised me most because my academic background is anthropology, cultural anthropology, study of cultures. I did an undergrad and a master's degree in cultural anthropology. And so when the Spanish publisher came, they were the first to want to get the rights to publish it in Spanish. And I said to my publisher, I don't know, does this work in Spanish? And they said, well, they've read the book and they, want, they say, want to publish it. And I said, well, let them publish it. And it became their bestseller. And then came the German, the French, and on up over, as I said, over 50 languages now. So apparently it does transcend cultural barriers. Now, I, I think maybe the way the languages are expressed certainly will be impacted by the culture. Uh, but these languages seem to be rather fundamental to human nature. Tell us what it would look like, a couple that had a full love tank versus an empty. I'm using the metaphor of a, of a gasoline tank in a car. If there's no gasoline in the tank, the car's not going anywhere. If it's full, you can drive a long ways. If it's got a fourth of a tank, you can drive a shorter distance. And so I'm using that to say that everyone has an emotional love tank and if the love tank is full, the relationship flourishes. If the love tank is empty, the relationship is really in trouble. And so what we want to do is keep the love tank full. So I sometimes suggest to couples who know the concept and who know each other's language that periodically you say to the other person, on a scale of zero to 10, how full is your love tank? And if they say anything less than 10, you say, what could I do to help fill it? And they give you an idea, and now you know. You choose to do it or not, but now you know. Uh, it's just kind of a fun way of keeping this on the front burner uh, in, in, a, in a relationship. I'm going to use that. That's a good one. <laughs> so for the long-distance couples out there, how do you portray quality time and physical touch? Okay, good question. We deal with that in a, a version of the book called The Five Love Languages Military Edition. Uh, and in that book, we talk about how do you speak these languages when you're deployed. So we interviewed scores and scores and scores of military couples who already knew the concept because military chaplains have been giving the book out for years. 
on, on ways to do this. For example, physical touch. You would think that would be impossible half world away. But one lady said this, I knew my husband's language was physical touch. So when he was deployed, I put my hand on a sheet of paper. I traced my hand and mailed it to him with a note that said, put your hand on my hand. I want to hold your hand. When he came home, he said to me, Gary, every time I put my hand on that paper, I felt her. <laughs> it's not literal touch, but it's emotional touch. And that's what we're talking about. And then a man said, I knew her love language is physical touch. So before I left, I said to her, I'm going to leave my jean jacket here. Anytime you need a hug, you put it on and I'll hug you. She said, Gary, every time I put it on, I felt his arms around me. So uh, there are practical ways, that, and we spell those out in that military edition. Uh, quality time, for example, an old-fashioned handwritten letter speaks to the person who has quality time as their language because they're sitting there reading it and they're thinking, man, they took time to write this thing. And then again, they can read it again and again and hold it in their hand. Uh, so th that, that really does speak to quality time people. And I want to close with, how do you think Christ shows us the five love languages? Well, it's very interesting. I wrote a book called God Speaks Your Love Language, uh, in which I did two things. I went through the whole Bible, just looking for these love languages from God. And, and they're all over the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. God speaks all five fluently. And I, I did that because people kept asking me, what's God's love language? <laughs> and I found out he speaks all of them fluently. But what I did discover is this, that often people are drawn to Christ when they sense his love in their love language. Uh, and, and there's biblical examples of that. Uh, Saul, for example, on the road to Damascus, he had a physical experience. He saw the light, his eyes were blinded, he fell to the ground, he heard the voice of God. <laughs> it was a physical aspect of that. He's blind for three days. Uh, and for some people, God does speak in a physical way. You know, they'll say, I was sitting there and, and, I, and, I, and my body started shaking and I started crying and I just felt God was all, all, on my body. And that draws them to Christ. And for others, they didn't have that kind of experience at all. You know, a quality time person will probably come to Christ. They start reading the Bible. They start reading Christian books. And one morning in a quiet place, they say, I believe, you know, uh, and then after we become believers, I think we tend to express our love to God in our own love language. For example, if acts of service is my love language, then I'm the one that volunteers to work in the soup kitchen, yeah. you know. So a uh, very, very interesting study in that book, God Speaks Your Love Language. That's so interesting. I never thought that we even show God the love that we show other people. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking to us. We're very excited to hear you speak tonight. And thank you so much for coming.